Hi, everyone. Welcome back to a new episode of Gen N. We are very excited to have the co-founder and CEO of Fiveable, which is an organization specifically for students who are trying to go along the path of AP and high school and college. So they do lots of cool things like AP study crash sessions, uh, different seminars and programs. And and so today we have us with Amanda Doe Amaral. So would you please introduce yourself, Amanda? Just tell us a little bit about who you are and how you came to Fi- Fiveable. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me. I um, So my name is Amanda. I founded Fiveable back in the winter of 2018. Um, and well, I was a teacher before that, but I moved back home with my mom to build um, without having to pay rent, which was nice. And now I am in Milwaukee and we've kind of built the team up to to 20 people now and just supported one and a half million students last month, which was pretty wild. So it's been kind of a insane journey for us and uh, just kind of trying to build a, a cool spot for, for high school students to get support. That's really impressive. One and a half million is a lot of people. I live in Utah, and that's approximately half of my state's population. So that's pretty impressive. <laughs> um, it was a lot. <laughs> what? How did? How did you come to find? I mean, to found Fiveable. What was? You said that you were a teacher. Were you an AP teacher? What motivated you to to start it? Yeah. So I was. I taught AP World History and AP Human Geography, and in uh, in Oakland. And I left after the 2016, 2017 school year, um, just kind of burnt out as a teacher typically gets. And about six months after that, some of my former students just started emailing me of like, Miss D, you got to help us. Like, we're all about to fail this, this AP US history exam. Our teacher is not teaching us. You know how it goes. And so I, I was like across the country at that point, actually working on a, a congressional campaign. I was like, yeah, of course I'm going to help them. I'm not going to let them fail. And so I just started live streaming and kind of creating these like group sessions for them. And, and then I was like, well, if my students need this, I bet other students could use this. And if I'm going to go live anyways, I may as well just invite more, more people. So I started dropping the links on Reddit and discord and in teacher Facebook groups. And next thing I know that first year I was teaching like 2,500 students. And I was like, (laughs) it was like this light bulb went off in my head where I was like, I could, it's like I can still be around students and have a lot of the best parts of teaching, but I don't have to go work at a school. So in this way, I'm kind of scaling my classroom and this is this sounds way more fun. So like let me let me just keep like pursuing this and seeing how do I get to a place where I can support the most students possible. And so that's basically how it started. And from there I just kept choosing things that would get me to like bigger and bigger paths. That's that's really incredible. Um, so what was your experience like with teaching? You said like, you know, the typical teacher burnout, I guess. What was your favorite part of your job? And then what led you to choose a different path away from teaching? Yeah, I, when I was in college, I switched my major to study social studies education. And so I, I had theoretically had planned to become a teacher, but I also worked at I had other cool jobs in college. I worked, I managed this like music venue. And so I also had no plans to be a teacher too. Like I was kind of in in between this, like I'm studying this thing, but I don't actually want to do this. And then I ended up, I graduated in 2012. There still weren't a lot of jobs out there. And so I was like, let me just go do Teacher America, which brought me to Oakland. And it, I needed the, I needed, I needed placement and I wanted to move out of my hometown of Boston. And so I I started teaching at at this awesome school and I got really lucky with my placement. And so I think some of the best parts of teaching were just like getting, I got, I had a lot of freedom in my classroom. Um, I got to really like, especially because it's history, there aren't a ton of like standardized tests and the the admin was pretty uh, hands off and, and didn't, you know, didn't really 
care too much about what I was doing. And so I got to really take a lot of the like history curriculum and do whatever I wanted with it, um, which was really fun. Like I could really rethink, you know, like what projects we could do and what a classroom should look like. And by the time I left, I had, I stopped giving grades. I was like only doing group projects. I flipped a lot of things in there. Um, and that, that was super fun, but it also was like the more that I've thought about it after I left, it was really like toxic workplace just as like a employee. Like I didn't have the resources I needed. I never was like appreciated. I was disrespected, not, not by the, not even by the students, by like the adults on campus. And so it gets to a point where you're just like, my mental health cannot take this anymore. And also I'm never going to pay back my student loans if I stay in this job. So I was like, I have to leave and I don't know what I'm going to do next, but I'm going to take a, take a chance and just go see what else I can do. And so that chance was it you I'm struggling right now. You said that you went and worked on a congressional campaign and then you kind of somewhat not really on a whim, but to help your students kind of started doing these classes and then it just built up. I mean, I'm amazed at how quickly that built up, but at the same time, it's really not that surprising. I mean, I think to my own high school experience and and going through AP classes and talking to students from other schools and hearing how different their AP classes were, how different their curriculum um, was and that same thing that happened to your students where you lose an AP teacher and suddenly you have a new teacher who's trying to adjust to this new curriculum, trying to understand this test, how to best prepare their students to take this test. I mean, that, that happened in my school. We lost our AP lit teacher the year I was going into lit. And that was, you know, it was a major problem for a lot of students. Um, And so it really isn't surprising that you were able to build this community so quickly because there really is such a need to equalize um, a lot of the the AP experiences, I feel like, because it it differs so much across the country. Um, I wanted to ask you about kind of, you know, if you're a student and your teacher may not be the best for preparing you for an AP test. Um, What are some ideas of how you can supplement your own education and help prepare you for that test if you feel like you're not being prepped at school? Yeah, for sure. This is like the, this was the thing for me, right? Like I left my school because there were just like adults on campus that were just not good at their job or even like pleasant to be around and thinking about my students in their classroom was so stressful for me and for them and I was constantly trying to help them or trying to convince them to take different classes just to avoid certain teachers and I was like it was you know it's like a minefield and so I really understand how just for a student you have you know five, seven teachers and different teachers every year, like out of all those teachers, chances are a a few of them are not going to be great. And that's a huge problem that is not the student's fault at all, right? Like that needs to be solved by a whole bunch of other things. And so for while I was teaching the, the advice I always gave to students, and, and I think this is still the advice now, it's just there this hap this this is not fair and this this is a very frustrating like reality of of just schools in America I think but there's always a there's always a way to like kind of push through right you're sort of you you're kind of playing a game in high school right you got to get the credits you got to do the things like are any of these things actually going to help you get to where you want to be I don't know maybe yes maybe no and so the, the best thing a student can do is is trying to like piece the things together. It's like, if I'm taking this class and I know this teacher is not preparing me, then I need to start to, I need to find other resources online, right? I need to connect with other students. I need to find other adults that could help me. And the same is true in, in life too, right? Like it's, I, I mean, I love my team now, but 
when I was working, you know, sometimes you work with people that you don't, you don't want to work with, or sometimes it's, you know, you can't always find the, the resources that you need. And so I think it's just about like trying to navigate around that blocker and trying to figure out like, you know, you want to pass this exam, the test is standardized, like whatever your teacher says doesn't really matter. All the information that you actually need to pass that exam is online, is available. College Board publishes all of it. You can access all the materials that your teacher is given, pretty much. And so you could really go around them and get all the resources that you need. For a student to do all that work is so extra. And so that's basic, that's essentially like what our thinking was with Fiveable. It's like, we, you know, we started with AP and we want to go beyond AP into we're launching college admission support this summer and um, a whole bunch of other things in the next year. But the idea is that no student should just be left out of the, the resources, the opportunities. You should be able to connect with other students that can help you get some, get structure, get someone who can just guide you through that. Um, and so I, I want to be able to provide that, that platform for students so that it's not it's not just like this super expensive thing that you have to pay for um, or like a world of YouTube videos you have to sift through. Like there's got to be something in between. Definitely. Especially currently with the, uh, the pandemic, I feel like now everything is such online and it's been difficult for myself as a student. And I can't even believe for your uh, teachers and other fellow students how difficult and crazy this year has been. Like, I think my biggest challenge was trying to learn calculus on Zoom, like online, especially when it's such a in-person, raise your hand every five seconds to ask a question type deal that you can't do online. And what impressed me was with Fiveable, you got over a million students so soon, just in the past month, and despite all these challenges with COVID. So how did you prepare for, and how did you adapt to like how this pandemic like changed everything and still you're still growing and it's such an amazing um, thing to see. Yeah. So we, started building four years ago or three years ago now and it it's sort of like we were I was because I was teaching and and then starting to build this I was thinking a lot about like what could be what needed to exist what it would look like to have like a real community platform like a space to go to um and it I think when I first started Fiveable there weren't a lot of other people who are convinced that that, sh that should exist or that could exist, right? It was really hard. Like I, I grew the, the audience of Fiveable through just meeting students where they are. Like when you Google AP things, Fiveable comes up and, and, you know, we're on social, we're like trying to do all the same things. Like that's where students are. And so we knew because we surrounded ourselves with students that this was very much aligned to what was already happening like there were already these massive discord servers and, re and subreddits and there's already this like study web that exists and so but the like the like adults in my life had no idea that existed and had no like vision of what could be built for that the pandemic i think really shifted everybody in a way that re really helped us because it, it got people thinking about what could be uh, the the actual like study web definitely exploded afterwards because every student was now online trying to figure out what was going on. But also all these like investors, people that wanted to work with us, you know, people on our team, all these other people, teachers were like, the, you guys are definitely on to something and you've been here before anybody else. And so it was, some of it was just sort of right place, right time. And other parts of it were, just really being aware of the changes that were happening through COVID and making like really intentional decisions right after that to, to double down on the things that we knew would, would work long-term. Yeah. I mean, I'd imagine that already having a digital infrastructure and online community is, you know, quite 
advantageous when school suddenly all goes online. Um, I'm sure that there are, there were countless students who were thrilled to find your community when they found out that, that their school year was going to be primarily online. Um, and I mean, the school year has brought massive change to obviously the way that we do education, specifically high school. Um, and my senior year of high school, which was 2020, there was massive changes to um, particularly AP exams and other standardized tests because we couldn't test in, you know, one place. Um, everybody was on lockdown. And so throughout all of this, this period where we're going through a lot of change and a lot of this change is probably going to end up sticking. I would, I would imagine. Um, there's a, there's a saying to not let a good crisis go to waste, um, in terms of making change. And what would you want to change about the way the AP system functions? Um, oh my gosh, everything. I, <laughs> I, I'm not even sure that AP should exist. I'm sort of like of this camp of like, we are this massive like world of standardized exams and college admissions and all these things that have been built. Like, I don't necessarily even know if I believe that they should exist and that this is like the right way to do things. Um, so I'm not going to get in front of students and say like, this is the only way that you can be successful. Cause it's not, um, this is like a mounted, like decades worth of just very like money driven people making decisions for you. And so for me, it's like, I want to build the supports that have to exist as long as these things exist, but I hope that they change too. And if they do change, then we can change with them. Like at the end of the day, being a teenager is not easy. Like you're trying to figure out what what you're going to be and how you're going to get there. And that requires people in your life that can inspire you and that can support you and like help you navigate whatever path you choose to take. And so I, my hope is that my hope is that things become more accessible, right? Like I think APs being online is is huge. Like I hope that continues that they at least offer an online version um, forever because that means that, and, and I know there are people working on this too. Like if people start to offer the actual class for credit online too, then you don't have to rely on those teachers that you can't trust anyways. All of a sudden now you can take whatever class you want and take the test online and you don't have to have you know, all these factors out of your control. Um, and, and same thing for just schools in general. Like I, I do hope that, like you just said, like this, this is a moment of massive change. Like there's a lot of things that, you know, obviously should go back. We, we do need in-person spaces again, but we also need to embrace what the internet can do and what online communities can do. And I think what's really obvious is that your generation clearly sees that and past generations just do not. And so you just have this like, that's why you have these like generation wars, right? It's like this huge difference of opinion of just like how the world works. And so my hope is that there's a lot more um, trust and like people just really trying to make things work online because it really can democratize access to information to people, right? Like you live in Utah. I live in Wisconsin. Like the, I grew up in Massachusetts The with, at a school that was like kind of big, but not huge. Like there weren't that many other students that liked the same things that I did, but there are in the country, in the world. And so what does it mean to actually like give students a chance to connect with anyone that actually like gets them? Like that can have like massive positive impacts but only if we actually embrace like what can happen online. So that's, that's my hope. Yeah, I'd say that accessibility is definitely a huge issue in education today. And the fact that you've reached over a million students in such a short amount of time is an indicator of that. Um, my question is, you know, with Five Bull's recent acquisition of ours, uh, you guys are clearly trying to spread out into the, well, what you, co what you coin as the study web. Um, are there any other uh, 
spheres of the study web, web that uh, Fiveable is looking to uh, get into to help students? I so the I love what's hap- what happens in this in that space. Like there, if you spend any time on any of these social channels, you can see this this very organic, you know, pull of where like students come together and they share resources and just are together. Like even in hours, it's like we you know students are just putting up task lists and setting timers and saying, okay, I'm going to work on this, you work on that you know, go. And then we'll take a break and we'll chat. And that, that is, is fundamentally like a huge change from what high school was like for me, just like working in my bedroom by myself. I didn't even have YouTube. So it's like, this is huge. Right. And so I think the way that we're thinking about it now is ours is a huge piece of the puzzle of, of a utility, right? It, this is something that I think a lot of students could benefit from. And then the other way that we're thinking about things is the, the communities that are already there, the creators that are already there, how else can we support them? Students and teachers are going to continue to create resources and share resources and curate resources. Like there's so much content out there. How can we, cre- how can we build a system so that it's easier for a student to f- actually find what they need when they need it um, rather than having to go to, you know, 10 different discord servers i'm curious now amanda what was your experience like in high school did you take any advanced prep classes do you like have an idea like oh my god i want to go be the president like what was your experience like in high school what goals and ambitions did you have (laughs) none of that i i only took one ap in high school and it was the only reason i took it was because it was psych and i heard it was pretty easy (laughs) and the teacher was kind of new and my friends were taking it and so i (laughs) i didn't take any other ap (laughs) class and if you told me then that this would be my job i would never have believed you (laughs) i i think that a, a lot of what i do and the reason why i like having these kinds of conversations and telling my story is because a lot of times in high school, you, you think that there's these like checkpoints that you have to hit. I, got, I have to graduate. I have to go to college. I have to take all these other exams. I got to get this internship. I have to do all these things. And then I can build whatever I, or I can do whatever I'm, I'm hoping to do. What I've learned in my life is that all of that is not real. <laughs> like none of those checkpoints are real. They're all made up because they they create urgency to like, do something else and they they also like build a system that specifically leaves people out right that people that can't afford those those types of checkpoints or they don't know how to navigate them then they don't do them and so I think that is that's the system that we lived in like when I was in high school I graduated high school in 2008 and it was just a very different place like for us it was like if you don't go to college then you're not going to be successful and you know, you'll have to work at McDonald's. That's literally what they would tell us. And we're like, okay, first of all, that's not fair to just like put an entire industry against us like that. Also, like a lot of people I know went to college, did all the right things, and then still couldn't make ends meet. So I don't know. I'm just, I, I'm frustrated by the entire thing of it. And when I was in high school, I, I definitely was not thinking about these things in this way and I really had no idea what I wanted to do I I kind of had a sense that like the job that I would want the most I didn't even know existed yet because all the jobs that people were talking about I knew I didn't want to do like doctor lawyer I was like I don't care about any of those things um so I kind of just followed I just kept following like whatever I was interested in like I went to college I I started studying history because I was like I like history And then, and then I was like, what am I going to do with that? And so then I started falling into these like traps of like, I guess I'll go teach. I guess I'll do this. Um, And, and really enjoying all the decisions I made. Like I would not literally would not be where I am today if I hadn't had just like done certain things, but not because I got like some degree or some test, you know, um, score. It was more because I, I met people and I was inspired by different things at different times in my life that have now like kind of culminated into who I am now. I think a lot of the system relies on the fact that, um, you know, the system expects people to have a life plan that they're going to follow when 
the reality is that, that most people don't have a plan. They just live. And, you know, life isn't something that was created with the purpose of a plan. It just happened. Um, and I think that our current systems are just too rigid to take that into consideration. I remember uh, when I was graduating high school, our community was rocked by the possibility of not going to college because it, it was unthinkable at my high school to not graduate and go to university no matter what it didn't matter whether or not you knew what you were going to do but you graduated and you went to university um in my year there was an alumni an alumnus that decided he wouldn't go to university dropped out and started a an online business and right now he's making millions yeah um and that that really just completely shook our whole vision of the world because someone who did the same thing as us, graduated, and is successful, purposefully not going to college. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think the internet in particular has led to that becoming very, very, very possible. I mean, Amanda, you've talked about the flexibility of and trying to build flexibility in online resources and. I, I think there's so much that you can learn online. There's so much that you can do online. There's so many ways to monetize yourself um, and get the skills necessary to monetize yourself online that traditional paths, particularly here in the U.S. as college has become incredibly expensive, um, there's become a greater incentive to not go to college and to receive your training elsewhere or to to start your own business or what have you. It's the internet has accelerated things and, and made things so much easier for so many people to where I think these rigid systems are becoming increasingly questioned. I mean, and, and that's supported by the fact that, that the majority of millennials are contractors, are self-employed contractors and not working for specific companies. And I think that our generation will continue that trend. Um, of working less work, working less for companies for long periods of time, going to college less, um, and receiving our education kind of online, which is why I think that programs like Fiveable are an incredible starting point for, for people kind of on that journey, um, of becoming educated online because they're able to start in high school. They're able to, to, get into these communities to kind of network a little bit in these communities and just, you know, come together and bounce ideas off each other. And, um, yeah. 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 It's like, you only know what you know, right? Like you, like when I was saying, like I, when I was in high school, all the jobs I was hearing about, I was like, you know, I knew what my parents did. I know my teachers, I know the jobs that they're talking about, but I didn't, there was all, I didn't know anything about tech until I started building this. Like, and I worked in the Bay Area. I was in the shadows of Silicon Valley and I still had no clue what was going on in the tech scene and I just didn't know anything about it. Like you, you have to be, you really, you have to have experiences around these things. You have, you know, you have to be introduced to different ideas and different options for you to even know that it's possible. And you have to see people that look like you that are doing that. And so I think that's that's kind of what drives us the most is is exactly that. It's like what what if we can get more students to 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 be exposed to different ideas and different pathways? Like we we don't we're not going to be the ones to tell students that you got to go to college, you got to do this thing, this is the path you have to take because there's there it's not. There's a lot of ways to do it and and I think the, the other thing that's important too is like the definition of success. Like we've also just been told since we were little, like what success looks like. And it's, it's really powerful to like really unpack that for yourself and think about like, this is your life. Like, do you want, like, what do you actually want? You know, like, how do you want to live it? What do you want to feel like? What do, you, what do you want your day to look like? Like remote work has definitely allowed people to be like, oh, I actually don't want to commute to an office and sit at a desk all day and then come home exhausted and not see my kids and not hang out with my dog. And like, it, it's completely flipped all of that of like, what I love is being at home and being, you know, able to do whatever I want and have the flexibility to like work when I want. 
And so that that kind of mindset shift is is really massive where that that you know no one ever thought about that. Like my mom just started working remote, you know, when everything went remote and she's just like if this if I knew I could do this 20 years ago, this would have been my life. Like I hate going to work. You know, like I don't want to go into the you know, it's nice to be around people, but it's like also nice to just like be at home. So I, I don't know. I think it's kind of cool to like to be in a space where I can kind of help students make these different connections. Somewhat quickly, um, I'm interested with your opinion towards kind of traditional education structures and such. Would you encourage more kids to take AP classes? Do you wish that you had taken more AP classes in high school? For a, for a long time, I did because I because in college I was frustrated that I didn't because a lot of other students had and they were able to get all kinds of perks like getting to choose their housing early because they were actually a sophomore and I was like this is dumb like <laughs> why why you know what I mean like we're we're just like creating these hierarchies. And so for there was definitely a time where I was I was actually frustrated with my mom for not making me take those classes. I was like, why didn't you push me to do that? Like everyone else did. And she was like, you didn't want to. Like, who cares? <laughs> so I think over time, I think what I've realized is that my life today is literally no different had I t- taken 10 APs versus one or zero. It, and, and the same when I think back to college, a lot of times, you know, this conversation in college happened too, of like, I've had to get this really good GPA. Like, I'm not going to go out tonight so I can study, like taking these trade-offs. And um, I had uh, someone in college that was, he's actually the Dean of Students, but he was sort of like a mentor that he told me once, like, it, it really doesn't matter what your GPA is in college. What matters is that you are making the most out of this opportunity, that you look back on this and don't regret things. And so, you know, spend the time learning, like, don't just like throw out your grades, but don't stress about getting a 4.0 versus a 3.0. Like, who cares, right? Like, no one ever asked me for my GPA after I left college, not even once. And so what I would regret is not having fun, not meeting people, not joining clubs and taking trips and getting all these different experiences. And so I think now I... I don't know that I would necessarily try to convince students to take more APs. I think it's a, it's a really good choice and especially like to take just one really changes your mindset because a lot of the reasons why I didn't take any APs was also because I didn't think I could, right? Like when I was actually in high school was like, that's hard. That's where the smart kids are. Like I'm not part of that group. I don't, I won't succeed. And so I just didn't do it. And so, and that's what I saw from a lot of my students too. And so changing that mindset for students is really important. Like actually being surrounded by this like really rigorous environment um, and taking that risk on is, that can be life-changing. So I would recommend that students do take those chances, like take on these challenges. Um, But, but you don't need to take 10 APs to do that. You know, like don't, don't set yourself up for like a very stressful time when, it's not really gonna, it doesn't make a huge difference in the end, right? Like, uh, you know, that's my two cents. Now, this question might be coming (laughs) late, but um, as a non-American, we don't have APs, so I'm not entirely sure what the concrete (laughs) advantage is to taking these advanced classes. I mean, I think the advantage is twofold. It's definitely that first thing I said, like, it it's just taking an advanced class in any school in any country. It does change your mindset of like, Oh, I can, I'm a part of this group. I can do this. But the like on paper benefit is that it transfers into college credit. And so if you pass, you know, AP biology, then you can transfer into, you know, when you go to college then you have these like biology credits. So then you don't have to take the intro to biology class, Hmm. um, which is sweet. But I think a lot of times it's like it doesn't actually save you money, though, because a lot of students still do four years. It, the, the bigger benefit is that you just don't have to do the intro class. So you can just jump into a more interesting like if you don't like science, then you got rid of that requirement. 
And if you love science, then you can skip the intro class and take more interesting versions of it. But um, at the same so, time, there's still the pressure of, you know, learning more and doing more and studying more when you're in high school, if you do take them. Right. <laughs> so, like, it's a trade-off. I mean, mm. it also depends on the teachers. There were, like, for in my school, for AP, for world history in 10th grade, you were way better off at, for my students taking AP than taking a non-AP because the non-AP world history teachers were nowhere, like, not good. <laughs> like, they mm. were not, they would not teach you. They were, it was just a, like, a hangout spot space. And so, but AP world, yeah, it was hard, but we were actually learning and we were good teachers that actually cared about students. So that was also another reason for those students. There were a lot of kids that I looked at that I was like, I know you don't think you can do the AP, but just do it so that you don't have to deal with that teacher. You know, like, well, we won't let you fail. We'll get you through it. Yeah, that's definitely true. Some of the uh, AP classes I avoided was because I didn't want that to be having me having to pull all nighters and not being able to go to a school dance or something. And it's, it's very pressuring, especially now with how competitive uh, school and college is now like those, there are those people who are taking like 10 plus AP credits and I'm over here doing my two AP credits. It's, it's definitely pressuring, but I guess what I've noticed over time is, sometimes those who look like they have it all put together no one like they don't know no one knows what they're doing so <laughs> might as well just live for yourself and do what you want and that's that's, so that's it what... exactly that's <laughs> and that's that is true in the startup world with investors nobody knows what they're doing everybody's making things up as they go and for you like you built a whole podcast so like you've built all these other skills that maybe people that chose to take a bunch of AP classes didn't and it's it's all a trade-off but it's just like do the things that you like to do that make you better that push you that that you find interesting and and just keep pushing into that and like something will work out you know like I don't know <laughs> I've mentioned in the past that um my school kind of had our our AP classes weren't actually that hard um, in terms of like, obviously the test is still the same at the end of the year. So you still have to study and such, but like the, the homework load and such was not very extreme. Um, and yet our school counselors would actively dissuade a lot of people from taking AP classes. Um, I had, I had a lot of friends who said that they went in to talk to a counselor about their schedule and their counselor was like, uh, oh, you probably shouldn't take AB calc, you know, like. You might not be able to, to handle it or whatever. And you had mentioned how you didn't want to take AP classes partially because you felt like that's where the smart kids went. And like it, that's a mindset that I've really become interested in fighting against. Because like you said, even, even if you don't want to take the test at the end of the year, um, there's still a lot to gain from taking an AP class in terms of, Maybe you get better teachers, you're better exposed to whatever the topic is. And hey, I mean, typically kids who are a little bit more motivated and such take those classes as well. So you you get to meet new people and again, that little networking aspect and such. And I mean, I, I had great time in AP classes just talking with the other kids in them. And I, I've been trying to... to think of ways, and we've talked to some other guests about this, about how we can create an environment where it we have less of this idea of, oh, APs for the smart kids. Oh, I'm not smart enough to take this class. I won't be able to handle it. Um, what do you think we need to do other than, you know, having our school counselors not actively dissuade people from taking classes? <laughs> um, what do we need to do to create kind of a safer atmosphere where we can actively encourage kids to take classes that um, can benefit them and can get them interested in topics. This is the thing, this is the thing that keeps me up at night. Like this is the, because it, it's so real. And I, I see it a lot, it, like even outside of high school too, just with other people I talk to that are like, I'm thinking about starting a company, but I don't know, like, you know, I'm not sure if I can do it. And, in general, I, I've 
fundamentally believe that anyone can learn anything and like we make choices about what we want to learn and what we don't right like I am not uh I'm not an astronaut right like I made that choice and I was like I'm not gonna learn that I but I've learned a lot of other things like when people say like oh I'm I'm just not good at geography that like bothers me so much because I'm like that's not a thing like you you can be good at that you're you're choosing not to be right like all the thing so but I think there's a lot of trauma that people have of someone told you something right like I feel like I probably had an art teacher that trashed my drawing that gave me a bad grade or something and and told me I wasn't a good artist and then I decided I wasn't you know and now I I don't feel like I am and I would be really nervous to like do some I don't draw but like I, you know what I mean? Like I could, I could, I could become an artist if I wanted to, I'd have to spend a lot of time learning how to do that. But I've decided that that's not something I'm good at because someone told me that I wasn't. And so I think what we'd have to do is, is we we would really have to like be intentional about reversing a lot of that and, and, and supporting people through, through that, like unpacking that kind of trauma is, is very difficult because sometimes people got it like a lot from parents from other students from siblings from whoever and so you have to literally peel away all of that to get them them back to a place where they can just be like purely curious right like like a kid again of like I can't like little kids know that they know they can learn anything they take risks they take chances and at some point that like fire is like snuffed out Right. And, and then we just decide that like, this is the track that I'm on and I can't do anything else. So I don't know. I think there, I think there would, there would have to be a lot done in our school systems. Um, but also I think a lot of other just like confidence building and just discussions like this, like people just need to hear it. Like when you, if you've never thought about that question or you've, you know, when you ever hear someone say, Oh, I'm just not good at math like push back on that that because they're just they are just reflecting something that someone told them and they just need to hear like that's not that's not a thing like you can be good at math you're no one is like wired to not be good at math you might not like it as much as you like something else and that's okay Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't be good at it Well, thank you so much for coming on and having such a great conversation with us today. So uh, p- please be sure to go check out Five uh, Fiveable. Their Instagram is Think Fiveable, um, and they are having a summer camp of uh, summer registration for college applications. And make sure to check them out around AP season or throughout the school year. They just had AP crash. Uh, uh, crash courses that were actually really helpful really love them so thanks so much and please be sure to go check out wavelf.org wave learning festival we're also going to have our own little summer program with different classes lots of different topics so please be sure to check that out and thank you amanda again and we'll see you next week